everybody. Where's my camera? Right there's my camera. <laughs> it is so weird. I'm over there. I'm over here. I'm over here. I don't know. I, I could be over there playing the piano, except Bill Sanders. You know I can't play the piano. No. Can't you have a hard time playing the radio. No, I do. Can't play a, uh, can't play a tune. Can, but I do know a tune when I hear one. I like them. And what did we think about Linda Autry's visit with us? Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. And now we've got an, uh, the Bible man is with us today. <laughs> we call Vicki the Bible lady. You'll be the Bible man. Ralph All Barker right. is with us. And you know, I will just say this. Oh, I hope I don't get in trouble. The world's in a male of a hiss. <laughs> And, and the Bible could straighten it out, couldn't it? It could, it could, if we did what it said. If we did what it said. Yeah. And what is happening to us that we are just flying by the seat of our pants, doing whatever we want to, getting into everything? What, what's going on? Well, and our government's not helping by passing laws that allows things to go on that shouldn't be going on. Exactly, exactly. And, and it is, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but I heard about it the other day, and I want to make a trip there. Do you know about the... Um, I want to call it a memorial for the unborn children who've been aborted up in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. Do you know about that? No. Uh -uh. Okay, it was an abortion clinic and it was destroyed. It was that the abortion clinic bankrupted and um, Right to Life bought it and tore down the building where all the abortions were done and created a memorial to every child that was aborted there. And it has these amazing um, tributes and it says, it's like a letter from the mom or a letter from the dad. If I had known then what I know now, I'm getting cold chills talking about this. Wow. But, yeah. but it was like thousands and thousands of babies. And, and this is in Chattanooga. And we'll Google it and get more information about mm -hmm. it. But it is a tribute to the unborn. And it was um, a letter from dad that said, I didn't know about you until it was too late and you were gone. And you know, maybe a, a young woman got pregnant and didn't mm -hmm. tell the dad and and then he found out later. And, and so this memorial tribute in Chattanooga is for those unborn babies. And, and we look at one of the things that America has, you know, everybody's up in arms. You have your right to an abortion. You have your right to not have an abortion. It's up to you. It's your body, your life. And everybody's, ex mad everybody gets angry everybody gets you know and it's just crazy because it is a life do, do it you, is a life do you know charlie wysong i don't well he at one time this was some years ago he pretty much single-handedly closed down all the abortion clinics in chattanooga wow he's got like 14 kids wow. and uh he put his own zip code yeah I mean, yeah uh, but he was very very successful uh in doing that that's awesome. And he probably has something to do with this. Well, I shared a picture last night of a, a precious baby that I adore. And this was after I heard about this abortion clinic, um, this tribute to these lost babies. And I said, this could have been that same child because you could have, she could have made that decision because the dad died when she was pregnant and she was going to have to deal with this alone and she didn't know how she was going to handle it and she made a decision to handle it yeah. and and we might say we have the sweetest cutest most beautiful child in the world and when i think that she might not have been right it just wow wow it sends cold chills keep you up at night won't it? oh yeah oh yeah yeah but I, hmm. I want to go visit this place i don't know emotionally how i'll deal with it you'll cry oh my gosh <laughs> i can't even imagine and they said it is gut-wrenching Mm. But that it is such an amazing tribute, such an amazing tribute, and it's just letters and notes and, and just stories of people who said you would have been 18 today or you would have been four today or you would have been, you know, whatever. And, and the parents leaving tribute to their unborn child. Yeah. Well, you know, I worked at a pregnancy center for right. 10 years. Yes, that's how uh, I met you, actually. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. 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 And so... Um, the ladies or the girls that come in and say they want an abortion, uh, if they do an ultrasound, 95% change their mind. Right. All they got to do is see the arms and the legs right. and there's something mm -hmm. really there other than a mass of tissue, yeah. right. which they tell them that that's what's there. Right. Um, so we've been very successful in, in thwarting a lot of the abortions. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we had one lady come in who uh, had twins and wanted to abort them and she did. And as soon as she did that, she came back in for post-abortion counseling. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. at least she got that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, you know, we, we've, uh, I personally have baptized, uh, uh, you know, in, in 
in the bathtubs, mm -hmm. things like that for children that were aborted, things like that, and giving them names. That's something that they say is very important wow. Wow. to uh, do that. That's so. sticking your mind, won't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when I heard about this, this is so weird, when I heard about this place that was turned in now to a memorial tribute, I was talking about, I was at Grady Hospital in the 60s where a friend had a miscarriage. And I can remember that little tiny jar with that little tiny baby. Mm -hmm. And and she was so sad, and and she only had one child the rest of her life. She had multiple. Um, she kept having multiple miscarriages. So there are women who would give anything to have a child, and then there are women who um, make that decision when they think it's the only right decision for them. And adoption is the right decision. Adoption is the right decision. If you're not in a position to raise that child, somebody out there would love to have that child. You know, yeah. and it just. So uh, I don't understand it. That's hard to, to, to rationalize, it the fact is. that they will go ahead and kill the baby mm -hmm. instead of letting someone else raise them, yeah. someone who really wants them. And, and there's a waiting list for children everywhere, everywhere. I think out of all the debates that I've watched and listened to, it comes back down to the fact that a lot of folks don't see it as a life until it's born and it has a breath. And then the people like us, of course, we see it as a life at conception. Right. So that's where the difference lies, and they don't feel like they're killing a baby. They feel like they're just getting rid of a piece of cell or something, you know. But yeah. like you say, you show them an ultrasound, and there it is inside you. That kind of weighs on you, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it changes does. It. Yeah. it does. Yeah, it changes it. It's a powerful instrument. Well, you know the story about <clears throat> my mother was set up for an abortion, an illegal abortion, and actually um, didn't have it. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> and. <coughs> it was when abortions were illegal and it was a back alley street in Atlanta with a coat hanger. Mm -hmm. And that's what abortion used to be. Yeah. And that was a desperate situation and um, she chose not to do that and uh, actually had somebody arrested and uh, it, was, it was a big stink. But um, you often get in a position that you think you can't do anything else. Then she left there and went to the Florence Crittenden Home for Unwed Mothers and was going to give me up for adoption. So there are choices. You can make a choice that isn't an abortion. You can make a choice to either give that child life and, and have, it, and families are willing to take care of you during your prenatal times. They're willing to pay your medical bills. They want to adopt a child. And so, you know, you can bring that baby to full term and then if you choose to, to let somebody else be their parent, you can. Mm -hmm. I have a friend of mine who used to work for me and she was a surrogate mother. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a difference. Now I can't imagine doing that because <laughs> once my, my hips broke and split and cracked and my pelvic bone jumped out, I'd have to keep that baby. I, I, it takes a very, very special woman to do that. Well, she's a, a special very, woman. very special woman. She yes. is. She's real pretty. She's a nurse, and uh, she, <coughs> that's she, amazing. She did it for a friend, I assume, somebody yeah. she knew. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a. I, it's a big heart. Yeah. That is a big heart. her for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're going to go over some stuff today to help us all out. With the well, I've just been thinking of you know even if you don't believe the Bible, if you don't think God wrote it, it doesn't matter. The principles that are in there work. Um, they did work and they do work. Uh, those of us that have um, been Christians for a while, we understand that uh, spiritual laws are just as real as physical laws. True. Um, especially when you get into things like uh, tithing. I've proved that over and over again. I mean, God, you can't outgive God. I, mm -hmm. I, I know that. Uh, but I was thinking of one particular scripture when I started to think about this. It's one, one sentence that would, if it was applied, would cut out most of the crime in this country. Anybody know what sentence I'm talking about? Love thy neighbor as thyself? No. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It's Ecclesiastes 8.11. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the Son of Man among them are given fully to do evil. True. You don't punish them quickly and, and the way it should be punished, then it just continues on. That's exactly what they're doing. Slap them on the put, putting them back in the street. That's so crazy that you said this today. And he's a bailiff too, so yes, he sees it. <laughs> there was a woman who stabbed a guy, I think they said 108 times, and yesterday she was sentenced to 100 years, uh, 100 hours of community service and a fine and counseling. Do you know why she got that sentence and she stabbed him 108 times? because she was smoking pot when she did it, and the pot changes the way you, now everybody says, oh, pot's not dangerous, pot's not dangerous. 
Pod's not addictive. Pod's not. Oh, it kills brain cells. It kills brain cells. <clears throat> so the judge said they brought somebody up who proved that in the state that pot will put you in, you're not aware of what you're doing. So she stabs him 108 times. She gets 100 days community service, a fine, and counseling. How do you think the family of the man who was laying there dead felt? Would you think that maybe the sentence should have been a little tougher? <laughs> yeah. Just a little well, tougher? Well, you know, this is something people don't think about. Scripturally, <coughs> Uh, there are no jails. Do you ever think about that? No. You're either killed, yes. you're executed, you go into indentured servitude if you can't pay off a bill, or you make restitution, or you're whipped up to 39 whips. Mm -hmm. So we need to set up some whipping stations in this town. Yeah, and, I agree uh, with that. My wife, one of the first arguments my wife and I had, and we've been married 30 years, <laughs> when I told her I believed in stoning, uh -huh. she just got all upset over that. And we talked about it. I look it. like I've been stoned. <laughs> he's, not, he's not talking about smoking pot either. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, okay. not that kind of stoned. Yeah. But, uh, but because of the principle of it, the community gets involved yeah. in saying this is not going to happen anymore. <coughs> right. And they stone the person. Right. Now, whether it's rocks or whatever it is, it's a, it's the community right. gets involved. And therefore, the, pr the, the criminals live in fear. Yeah. But we've chosen for us to live in fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're letting the criminals back out so yeah. they can do it again. Yeah. On the way to work today, I had this conversation about a, a location in Atlanta where I used to go all the time. We were talking about a certain restaurant that closed. Well, it was a fantastic restaurant, but it had to close because the community became full of violence and anger. And if you parked your car there to go in and have a fantastic meal, your, your car was broken into, anything you had in it was stolen or it was just vandalized. So the restaurant, after over 60 years, had to close. That's what happened to America. Nobody was held accountable. We're still not holding anybody accountable. Uh, it proved it yesterday in the courtroom. A hundred days community service. The man's dead. He's dead. He's really dead. You, you stab somebody 108 times, you're pretty dead. It's called murder. <clears throat> it's murder. But because they brought in a specialist, um, a genius, who said, well, she didn't know what she was doing. Gosh. So does that mean we should get by with murder if we're doing a drug that's illegal? <laughs> and no, I think they said that was the point. Where she was smoking the pot, it was it was his drug, and she took two or three hits off his drug. So do we put the blame on him because he handed her the drug that then forced her to go into a stupor and then she killed him? <laughs> she got 100 days, y'all. Yeah, 100 days gets... for a life. <laughs> Well, Does thing, that so, sound real? That's real. It was on the news this morning. Well, I'm sure it's it real. is. Well, it's I, real. I believe. <laughs> but I mean, another it's thing. It's crazy. In this country, if I go out and I kill somebody, you know, first degree murder, you know, bam, go to jail, um, get the death penalty, mm -hmm. I'll be sitting on death seven row for years. 20 years. Oh, yeah. Or you'll get out in seven years because something else good, will change. Good behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but the thing is, we're paying, the taxpayer pays for them to sit there country for 20 club. years. Yes. In while the country while club. we're waiting. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, it's just yeah. it's crazy. Well, we criticize third world countries for taking a guy out behind the jail and putting a bullet in his head. It's yeah. just too quick. Yeah, but, but it works. My dad was uh, convinced before he died. He always told me this: if we still had lynchings in the you know hangings in the town square once a month or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff would stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you you see you see that you are punished for what you did rather yeah. than just, oh, And well, it's done in know. public, too, where oh, yeah, it can yeah. be witnessed. And this but. thing, I, you know, I, I know that innocent people have gone to jail, and I understand oh, yeah. that. Innocent people have gone to jail. But at the same time, um, the judicial system, once you go through the process, and, and, you know, I was on a jury, and out of this jury, 11 of us immediately, guilty, all four counts, and one woman, and I looked at her and I said, oh, we're not giving him a free ticket to ride. This ain't going to happen. And we talked about it and talked about it. That ain't happening. We're going to redo this. We're going to vote again. And we're going to discuss this again. And we're going to discuss this again. The judge thanked us. He had like an 18-page rap sheet. He got life. He got life. And she was willing to let him walk because, well, what if? And I was like, what if bullfrogs had wings? They wouldn't bust their tail, you know. And I was like, we are not going to let him walk. We didn't know what he, he looked like a Baptist preacher sitting there. He had on a suit about like you got on. He looked like a Baptist preacher sitting there. And when the judge, we stayed for sentencing because we wanted to know. Yeah. And at that stage of the game, you find out mm -hmm. that you made the right decision. And he got life. Yeah. He got life.
So we get a little bit of everything mm -hmm. over here, even in Gilmer County. Um, we've had, I've been on five child molestation cases. Oh, that's what's heartbreaking. Oh, yeah. it is. I have yeah. some of the women, I've had them faint uh -huh. in there. I've had them run out crying. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah. It's much, much harder on a woman, uh, yeah. but they're on the jury. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and now I disagree with that. I think it's harder on a man. Well, they're not crying and running out and fainting. No, I think that emotionally it destroys a man from within. I, I, I think truly. You're talking about the perpetrator? No, or I'm the... talking about the child who was abused. Oh. If it's a male child, yeah, oh. I think that that is the hardest thing for a male to ever get through because they feel hopeless and helpless. And men aren't supposed to feel that way. Men are supposed to be the strong one that takes care of everything, that solves every problem. And often if you have been abused, then you don't feel you have that power to do that. And, and you become a different person. Well, I think that's true maybe for both. I mean, I know that one, one out of three women are abused at some time in sure. their life. One out yeah. of three. And men Witnessed had, it. Yeah, well, it's, it's true and, yeah. it, and it affects their lives. Sure. And men too, um, depending on what it was. But yeah. it, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing. I probably shouldn't say this on TV, but if it happened to one of my kids or my grandkids, they wouldn't make it to court. I know. <laughs> I know. A lot of men oh, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Uh, and, yeah. and so many of us feel that way later. You know, when you hear about it, you're like, that really couldn't have, yeah. I ain't really saying did. I'd kill them, but yeah. they wouldn't be able to do what they did again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got <laughs> it you. Leaves a, yeah. It leaves a lot of things open. Yeah. Does, uh, does uh, <laughs> the Bobbitt case come to mind? No yeah. comment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not above that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it just, you know, you've got these innocent children. Well, you know, and that kind of stuff, I was telling Ralph earlier, it's just a shame. It's, it's sad, but it, it's just disgusting and it's awful. And some of that just needs to be cut off. You yeah. know what I mean? Yep. Literally. Yep, yep. Just cut off. Yep. They should get the death penalty. Yeah. It doesn't in this yeah. I mean, There's nothing yeah. in this life, to me, worse than hurting a child. Right. Well, do you know that in the state of Georgia about... 12 years ago, the statute of limitations was removed. If you were abused, if you were molested as a child, there was a seven year period. Now there's no, no time frame. You can, if you, if, if you get strong enough when you're 25 or 28 or 29, you can now prosecute your abuser because the statute of limitations was removed from that, which was a great bill yeah. during David Ralston's time in the house. That's good. That's and good. I was very thankful for that because if you're a little girl and something happened to you and you can't deal with it, you can't deal with it, you can't tell anybody, then you grow up and you're 23 years old and then you can deal with it and you sit down and you give every detail to everything. That seven years has passed, but now with the statute of limitations being removed, you're, you can be court bound. Hmm. So that's that's an awesome thing that they, the state of Georgia did, and I'm very thankful for that. That is a good thing. I think it's House Bill 1167, if I remember right, but but it was during David Ralston's time, and um, I was very thankful for that. Well, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, but that's just one thing that would set my rage so far off track Yeah. that I don't know what I'd do. I know. I know. And I know I, you're the kind of man that men are meant to be. They are to protect their family, to cover, cover their family with I'm love. I'm a gentle giant, but you are. that's the kind of thing that would yeah. set me off in yes. a second. Yeah, it would. It I'd would, have to ask forgiveness for yeah, it. Yeah, it would anybody, you and know. you don't understand. And, we, you know, the Ku Klux Klan is not a good thing, but when the Ku Klux Klan started, it had good ideas of men who beat their women and men who drank all the time and men whose children were hungry. They went to their house and said, you better quit drinking and, and acting crazy. That's what it started as when my granddaddy and all them were involved in it way back when. But then it changed. But, but if we didn't hold these men accountable, if you're a drunkard and if you don't work and if your children are hungry and if you have no electricity in your home, and your wife has black eyes every day, then you need to be held accountable. <laughs> yeah, you need to be held accountable. But we don't do that. Mm -mm. We don't do that. We don't do that with our leaders either. No, you can't. No, There's just no. nobody's responsible. We're almost just like, well, mm. well, you know, that's so stupid. Well, tell me this. Why, why do? Why is there an issue at the border? like we have today. There should not be. I'm all about that electric fence at the border. I think that'd be awesome. Well, it would be. But I mean, the fact is that nobody takes responsibility. They know that it can be stopped tomorrow. It can be stopped today. But you know why they don't? Because both sides use it for fundraising. 
Yeah. They do. That's more yeah. important, raising yeah. the money than let the people yeah. die from the fentanyl. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and the terrorists, yeah. who, who, where are they right now? Right, right. And it's like the young man I was talking about earlier. I mean, it, it's heartbreaking because he went through so much, he accomplished so much, and he progressed and then gone. You know, you know, coming in here this morning, I didn't think we was going to get this deep in here, but uh, this it's is some deep, deep conversations. Yeah, yeah, and it's what's happening in our country. Well, it is. Yeah. It is what's happening, and people are afraid to talk about it. Well, you need to talk about they're it. They're afraid to talk about time. abortion. They're afraid, afraid to talk about drugs. And if you say, well, you know, you shouldn't do drugs, you shouldn't do this, shit. well, okay, the drugs attack you. And first of all, do you believe in Satan? <laughs> yes. Okay. Satan is here to seek and destroy, and he's doing a really, really good job. He sees a weakness in you or in your family or in something you care about, and Satan sneaks in. Mm -hmm. And when he sneaks in, it's very, very hard to get him out. And I've seen him in every shape and form you can put him in. And uh, it's amazing. It's amazing how hard he works. It seems like Satan's working harder now, especially after COVID. I think people were kind of down and out and depressed, and, and Satan kind of snuck in a little bit more. We're seeing a lot more depression. We're seeing a lot more people suicide. The yeah. suicide rate is up. Yeah, we're seeing things. Satan's real. He also, is so you real. got uh, um, the book. Uh, I'm trying to think. Who, uh, Jonathan Kahn, who wrote The Return of the Gods. Mm -hmm. Did you read that one or mm -hmm. see that not. at all? Uh -uh. Well, he's making the case that the, the, the ones that we read about in, in the Old Testament, a lot of the gods uh, are back because they see our weakness and they see the, the holes that uh, have been opened up for them. Sure. And uh, he makes a really good case yeah. that these are real demonic mm -hmm. type things. That, I believe it. I, I believe in Satan and I believe in angels and I have seen them both. I've, I've, I've really witnessed Satan. But, but the angels, the angels will come. And, and I, I saw an angel one morning and I was like, oh my gosh, all right, okay. And then I was like, I'm gonna make it through this. I'm gonna be okay. And it was weird, but it was like this peace came. I mean, you and saw an angel? I saw an angel. Like, what, you, what did he or she look like? Um, a, a beautiful, a beautiful light. Oh, just beautiful, a beautiful, light. beautiful light. Yeah, a beautiful light with form. It was really, it was amazing. <laughs> I tell you, the, the one I actually had an angel encounter, but it was a beautiful blonde. Oh wow! No, I'm serious. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is that out in Vegas? No. <laughs> That's funny. No, this was true. I was going to Chattanooga, and I I wasn't sure I was going right, so I, I was pulling into a church, but there were it, the bar was closed, so all I could do was get like three feet off the highway. I wasn't there. 30 seconds and this beautiful blonde in a jeep pulls up and says can I help you oh wow and I said funny. no um, but I'm just doing this I'll be done in a minute and she goes down the road about 100 feet and pulls into a driveway and sits there and I'm watching her and fixed up my stuff and uh, pulled out and went this way and she just waved at me like we were the best friends that we've ever met and she goes back the other way that's weird yeah, it was an angel. My brother-in-law had that same encounter. It's weird, yeah. One got out and stopped him and, and wiped his lens off of his uh, headlights because they were dirty. And they, he said something about helping him, so he gets back in his car, the angel does. And my brother-in-law looks back there and there's nowhere to get off of this road and all of a sudden that car's gone. That crazy? Just kind of helped yeah, him out. Yeah. But was trying yeah. to, yeah. I think in my case, was trying to, God was trying to slow me down. Yeah. I mean, maybe I was going to have a wreck or something. Sure, sure. But yeah, it was just, yeah. I don't In usually, his time, in his time. And you, if you know me, I don't forget beautiful blondes. Yeah. But yeah. I couldn't identify her in, yeah. a, in a lineup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Well, I've had uh, opposite encounters in, with the other side. Yeah, yeah. Too. Satan is real. Yeah. yeah. I got in my car one night after work and I felt this presence beside me in the seat. And so I, I started up the car and I started down the road and I just started praying in Jesus' name, get out of my car. And as mm -hmm. soon as I did, a bat hits my windshield and it dies right there on my windshield, wow. just like that. <laughs> wow. And I never experienced that wow. again. Wow, wow, wow. So I mean, it's, they're both yeah. sides. Yeah. Well, one of my friends has a cup that she drinks out of every day and it says, not today, Satan. And I love that because we, we have a choice. We can allow him to destroy us. Punch him in the nose. Or we can, yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, hit him in the, hit him in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. But uh, it, it was funny. Did you see the show Monday? I had a, a, a world champion karate guy on, and I told him, I said, we planned this all wrong 10 days ago. I looked a whole lot worse. I should have been <laughs> agile then. <laughs> and we could have said, yeah, she had two lessons. And look at her face. <laughs> so. I go back to the, Ralph, the scripture I mentioned a little while ago, though. If we would love thy neighbor as thyself, and what Jesus also said, that, that I would, that you love one another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Where yeah. has that gone? I mean, that's what I'm seeing in this world today. Everybody's out for themselves. Sure. There's no love sure. anymore. And and the uh, money is the the love of money is the root of all evil. And and you witness that day in and day out and day in and day out. But I've told you this story about my grandmother taking care of my grandfather all of his years in a hospital bed, in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. multiple sclerosis from the time he was 36 years old. She walked to a babysitting job where she made $5 a day. She, she did everything she could to keep food on the table in their house. There was no Medicaid, there was no home health, there was nothing. She did it all and lived on $105 a month. And when she passed away, she had enough money saved to pay for their monument on their grave and to pay for their funerals. She had no insurance. It's discipline. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is amazing. And I said, if my grandmother was running D.C., <laughs> it'd be very, very different. But, but you know what she made? A commitment to loyalty. Mm. A commitment to loyalty. Where's that going? Oh, it's gone. It is gone, gone, gone. And and I love, I always send congratulations on anniversaries when I see somebody who's made it. And a dear friend of ours um, lost her husband last year to cancer, and she is really, really struggling. And then another dear friend of mine lost her husband to a stroke. And the one that lost him to a stroke said, as hard as it hurts and as bad as I feel, I wouldn't want him to hurt this bad. So I shared that with this one today because I was like, would you want him to feel the pain you're feeling today? Because death is real. You're going to die. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Yep. We're going to die. Would you want to leave your spouse that you love so much here to suffer the way you're suffering? Or would you want to go first? What, what do you want to do? Do you want to I've thought bury about him? That. How we do, we how talked do you about it last that? night. I thought about that. How yeah. do you deal with that? You know what I say? Women are stronger. Don't, are. don't slap me. Women are stronger no, you're right. than men. You're right. Women are stronger than men. I always thought I would die at 40 from stress. And my poor husband, the second month that I was dead, he and Nick would be sitting there with no electricity because they wouldn't know how to go pay the power bill because I did everything. <laughs> and my husband was the hardest worker in the world, but he didn't take care of anything like that. I took care of all that. And so I used to stress about that because I thought at 40, the stress level I'm living with, I'm going to die. And then bless his heart, he's going to be sitting here in the dark. I would not want him to do that. And and do you do you know the story about when we went to buy Diet Cokes on sale in Blue Ridge? I think my I husband was dying of cancer. <clears throat> my husband was a doer. It was like, you know, I'll go get you this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And I'm riding him around like the last days of his life and we stop at a gas station. And my husband was a bargain shopper too. And I look and I said, Sugar, I said, they've got 12 packs on sale. I'm going to buy a bunch of 12 packs. I'm going to pull over and load up the avalanche. And he said, please don't. And I said, what? I'm thinking, this is not my husband because my husband is like, buy 80 cases of them. And if it doesn't fit, we'll go buy another truck, put them in. So I looked and I said, what do you mean don't? And he said, it's going to look bad that you're out there loading all those drinks and I can't help you because at that stage you couldn't walk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it made him feel bad because, I, you know, I was going to do something for him that he would have loved any other time because I was going to save some money. But he didn't want me to because he didn't want to look like the man who wasn't taking care of me. Yeah. And that's what men, that's what you do. That's what you do. That's what hate, men are designed to do. I told my wife about it, too. I told her, I said, I think I'd rather go first because it would kill me to just have to go to your funeral. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, we saw that with Rick and Selena. Yeah. We saw that with Rick oh, and yeah. Selena. Selena was the strong force, and she went to be with Jesus, and God bless Rick. I mean, it is tough. Yeah, it, it is. is. I talk to him occasionally. It's tough. <coughs> it's very, I, very tough. I remember I was on a cruise ship, and I ate something. I think it was Indian food, and it, I, you know, I was thinking I was going to die. So I was laying in bed, and I turned over to my wife. I said, do you know where the money is? <laughs> oh, <that's funny. laughs> she thinks I'm dying now because I'm telling her where the money is. Yeah, All yeah. kind of secrets going on. <laughs> but I live through it. And, yeah, uh, yeah. But I thought we talked about this last night in bed about one of us dying. Yeah. And because uh, one of us is going to die at some yeah, point. we are going to die. And yeah. uh, she, I mean, she loves the Lord so much, I'm not worried about her at all. So, I mean, if she dies, I mean, I know she's fine. Yeah. And I do know where all the money is. I pay all the bills, so it would be easier yeah. for me. If she has to do it, I've told my goddaughters and friends, say, go look at this book where I've got everything hidden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it tells you what to do, who yeah. to call, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. where the credit <laughs> cards yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 
Well, we all, we all know the way you were raised this way, you were raised this, I was raised this way. We know what's right and what's wrong. Yes. We oh, know yeah. how you're supposed to treat people. We know what kind of commitments you're supposed to make. I learned it from my grandmother who was the mm. best in the world. And when I see people, we have another mutual friend that is battling Parkinson's mm -hmm. and had to do the battle alone and lost everything he had. And nobody was there to support him and be with him. And that was heartbreaking to me. That was so heartbreaking because he gave of himself all of his healthy life mm -hmm. and then was left alone when he needed somebody. And, and I've seen tears pour down his cheeks by the bucket yeah. because he was left alone to, to, to have to handle this. Uh, yeah, back in COVID, one of my friend's parents, father anyway, was passing away and he couldn't see him because of the yeah. COVID thing. Yeah. So he had to die alone. Mm. Yeah. That, to yeah. me, that's criminal. It, yeah. it is criminal. It, well, let's, if we get to talking about that, it is criminal. Yeah, what they did to us is criminal. But yeah. well, we're going to share some photos and then we're going to get to you in the Bible. But I want to share my little success story. Miss Zanna is, um, Golly, y'all, she was. She had the flu for about a week, and it scared me to death. I was terrified. Her temperature was like 103.8, and she, she's a busy, active, going-to girl. And when she was just limp, you just worry, you know, worry, worry, worry. But I got to see her last night, and there she is. And she was at the Waffle House terrorizing the Waffle House. They love her to death, <laughs> and she loves to eat at the Waffle House. So. There's Zanna, and for everybody who prayed for her, thank you, thank you, thank you. We got her back to, she's still stuffy and still has a runny nose, but she's healthier, and we're so very, very thankful for your prayers because she was, look, <laughs> that was lemon. <laughs> <laughs> she loves lemons, oh my gosh. <laughs> she didn't like that. that one too much. <laughs> That's so funny. But we are so thankful. Now this, if you are looking to move one mile to Lake Blue Ridge, I have a house, 11.9 acres with a, a house, a five car garage, and you can <laughs> literally walk to Lake Blue Ridge. It's 1.1 mile to the lake. Beautiful, beautiful property up in Morganton. And if you are looking, bring me a deal and we will talk. Uh, it is a beautiful, beautiful property. Can it you, is settling you, in a state, and this is what we're building in Ball Ground. Can you walk that far to the lake? Yeah, I can. One point something miles? One point one mile, I okay. can indeed. These are some of the houses we're building in Ball Ground. This is the Rebecca. It is a beautiful, beautiful home. They are available in Malone's Pond, and Malone's Pond is the greatest community with a uh, Walking about 1,258 steps, you get to downtown ball ground, and we're really, really excited about it. It is going to make new things happen, and uh, it's it's going to be exciting. We're going to bring in some families. I love that people with children, everybody wants to be in a good school community, and we are in the best school district, so it's really, really cool. But this, again, is Vircher Homes, and we will be featuring them. We've got five on the ground uh, under construction right now and getting close to uh, maybe a, a finish date in about 65, 75 days with one of them. So we're getting there. But how cool is that? I love that house next door because it has a fireplace in the corner. Isn't that cool? You need a fireplace overlooking your creek. <laughs> that would be neat. And there's a video and I look like I'm drinking, but I'm not, but I'm trying to walk and chew gum at the same time. So that, that kind of explains that, but yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful What's house. What's the square footage of something oh, like that? Oh, we've got them. Um, they're starting at about 3,100 up. Oh, they're good size houses. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think there's one that's about 27, but um, they're up to about 5,000 square feet in uh, beautiful, beautiful houses. And Bircher Homes is, they do not leave any detail out. They are fantastic. Do they so, have a doorbell? Yeah, they got a doorbell. They got a doorbell. They got a doorbell. All right, let's get to a little bit of the Bible and see if we can encourage people to let's stand strong. Is it a year we need to be standing strong? Every year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's, uh, it's hard. It's really hard today because we're getting into the the if we speak speak the word or speak truth, uh, we're getting in the uh, hate mongers. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes. the labels that they're putting on us. And you know, you think about this going back thing back to Al Gore. Uh, he's the first one I remember that called 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 us something terrible. We were the 
what do you call it, a half chromosome, extra chromosome crowd, mm -hmm. meaning like we're mutants. Mm -hmm. And same thing, the, the crazies, the deplorables, the Democrats always label us as half the country as being something wrong and evil yeah. and sick yeah. and all these things. Um, so nothing we can do about that. That's part of the times we, we live in. But knowing what's right and wrong, mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that um, we're not taught in school anymore. Typically, the schools not taught at home either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it goes both ways. Um, tell you, it's just something very interesting. Tradition has brainwashed us to a lot of degree. Have you ever thought about that? Mm -hmm. In the church, there's mm -hmm. a book uh, called Pagan Christianity, and he goes through the history of the church and shows how we got paganism into the church. Like the churches today have nothing to do with the first century church. Uh, you can make a story out of that. It goes quite a ways. But what's interesting to me is the fact that, like going back to Christmas, I know we're right over Christmas, but this is something that was an aha moment to me about how tradition has, has distorted our beliefs. Um, I've, I've asked people the story when the angel appeared to the shepherds and said that Jesus had been born in the city of David, you'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. The question came up, and I never thought about this in my life, how did they find the baby? Star. Um, they go door to door. Do you have a baby in right, swaddling clothes? I don't know. A star. There wasn't a star. A star of Bethlehem. That's what most people say. There wasn't a star. There wasn't? No. That's because of the... Why are we singing that song then? <laughs> well, the star did rest over him afterwards. Okay. Two years later. Oh, oh, Two years well. <laughs> later. It was, a, it was not a toddler anymore. It was a, a child. Uh -huh. And it was in a house. Wow. I mean, it says that in scripture. But everybody says that. They say, what about the star? I said, well, there wasn't a star. So I think this is just, this is a theory, but, but it makes a lot of sense. These priests, or the, these uh, shepherds were a Levitical priest. So they were the ones that found the perfect babies, the perfect lambs. And they would take the lambs and wrap them in swaddling clothes and put them in a manger. So jo Joseph and Mary could find no room in, in which was uh -huh. the guest room. Right. Um, and the stories tell us they went downstairs into a barn or a cave and had the baby that night probably it sounds like um, but I think they went to the birthing tower which Migdal Eder is what it was called and that's where the the baby lambs were were taken care of and why wouldn't the lamb of God be born there along with the perfect lambs that makes sense can't prove it but it makes sense right and um, there's videos on that if you want to go look at some of the proof or some of the people teaching that particular. Can you, from what you want to talk about today, explain to somebody who is a non-believer how you, how could you, how could you not believe? How could you not believe? And there are a lot of non-believers in today's world. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well they have to see it and touch it and smell it to believe it. Okay. Science wise. I, that's exactly what they told me, that it's not, show me the science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I made a 23 average in science. I can't show you the science. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me how well, you would it comes down to faith. as a pastor, how would you do that? How would you handle that? Well, first of all, a person, uh, regardless of what they believe, they really can't believe in God until God does something first in their hearts because we're walking dead men. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, right. yeah, a dead person can't choose life. Right. So right. as Nicodemus says, you've got to be born again, but God has to start the process. Right. Um, my cousin was a good example of that. I took her to church. She was, a, she was an agnostic. She was a former Catholic, got mad at the church and just stayed an agnostic. Smoked pot all the time. And I tried to get her to come to church and she wouldn't, she wouldn't, she wouldn't. And five years later, she calls me up and says, I'd like to go to church with you. And I'm saying, who is this really? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, why do you want to go to church? <laughs> you know, a little suspicious. But anyway, I took uh, Paul Walker. I don't know if you remember who he was at Mount Perrin Church of God. No, down in Atlanta, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. great preacher. And I was so excited that she was going. And they had a musical that night. And I'm thinking, oh, she's not going to hear the gospel. Uh -huh. And so Paul Walker, at the very end of the musical, just said, uh, Jesus is coming. Are you ready? And she got saved. Wow. Just like that. She wrote me a letter about how that happened. I still got it. Wow. Uh, you, you can't talk somebody into getting yeah. saved. Yeah. I mean, God's yeah. not working on their heart at that time. I mean, you're just wasting your, your breath. Right. You, you don't know that. You're, plant, you're trying to plant yeah. a seed. Yeah. 
and those seeds grow, I mean, at some mm -hmm. point for oh, yeah. many people. Mm -hmm. So you don't give up. You just tell them what you know. It could be years before it grows. Years. If bad things happen to you, do you feel like God is doing it to you and punishing you? How do you explain that? Because I, I have so many friends who've lost children. Yeah. And we all gather together, and we hate being a member of this club, but we're a member of this club. And, and like one lost a child in an automobile accident, one child was killed, one child, you know, so many different ways that our children died. And you're like, is God mad at me? Is God punishing me? How do you explain that? Book yeah. of Job. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, My daughter keeps saying, Mom, you're going to do just like Job. You're going to do, you know, you're going to be just like Job. Just he didn't just, do anything wrong. Yeah, exactly. No, he was, I mean, he was the, the one that God man. said he was yeah. a righteous man. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we are tested, I mean, and see what we're made of. Um, when you go through bad times, this is a different angle of this, but somebody told me this. I went through a really bad time one time. I mean, I was just down, down, down. And people were watching me. You don't think about that, but when that happens, people are watching you I'm to sure. see how you handle it. Yeah. And I didn't ever abandon God at that point. Mm -hmm. I just stayed there until mm -hmm. something good happened. But you know, everything's, I believe everything's for a purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not a random thing I've, like I've, we think it is. I've convinced myself of that. Yeah. I've had to convince myself of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, good things, and good things usually come out of those horrible things. And it's crazy, but I've got something I forgot to give the guys to download that I wanted to play today. But Linda Jordan, who actually lost her daughter in a horrific car accident, gave me a, a memory of my daughter with an angel on it that is on the window of my, on the mirror of my car. Mm -hmm. And when I play music, it kind of goes back and forth and I, and I make fun of it. If I'm going fast and I've got Bestel going and it's happy music, then that angel's going faster, you know. And, and so we, we get together and we, we congratulate each other from going through another day of being a mom who lost a child. You know, I mean, it's pretty sad, but, but we know that you are sent as low as you can possibly go when you lose a child. There's nothing any lower. Mm -hmm. And then you got to work your way back up. And you're right, people do watch how you work your way back up. I remember when I first came back, I couldn't stop crying. But I didn't cry on the air. But the minute the cameras were off, I was just bawling. And it took about four years to get over that. And then the first day that I didn't cry when we turned the cameras off, I felt guilty. Mm. I felt guilty because I thought, I haven't forgotten my child. Why am I not crying today? And it's because God was giving me peace. Mm -hmm. And God was, you know, he was a little bit slow getting there with it because <laughs> about three years of tissues and eye makeup down my face, I was like, okay, God, are you going to let me quit crying? But it was very weird. It was a very weird feeling of peace. And it takes a long time to get there. Well, you know the song, Four Days Late. Oh, yeah. Yep. That and was Angela's song. That was my I, daughter's song. Yeah. She loved that song. When I get down, I'll play that song. Call out your name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when he rolls back the stone, you'll call out your mm -hmm. name. Yeah. But there's yeah. just so much, there's just so much uh, dealing with things like that. I, I was in uh, deliverance ministry for a year. Uh, I mean, I saw demons. I mean, you know, uh -huh. I saw what they do oh, yeah. and how they manifest. Oh, yeah. and. It, yeah. it was a weird, weird experience, yeah. but uh, anybody who doesn't think the devil's real. Oh, yeah. And sometimes it's in the case of Job that uh, God let him do these things to, to Job. He said, you can't kill him, but you can do this and this and this. And he did it. Yeah. The only thing that kind of kind of bothers me, I guess, in the sense that Job lost his kids. Yeah. yeah. And then said, well, God says, well, I'll give you some other kids. You know, I don't yeah. know if that's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, like, yeah, come on yeah. in, you know. It's tough. It's <laughs> That's tough. a tough one. Yeah, very well, tough. a lot of times we look at those stories from our point of view, mm -hmm. and it doesn't quite make sense sometimes, and you got to back up and think, okay, well, God had his reasons. I've just got to accept that because I'll never understand why. No, mm -hmm. no. I, I was telling somebody last night, we were having a lengthy conversation, and I had this list. And when I get there, me and God, I, I just want five minutes. I just want him to answer about 11 questions because I will be like, really? You did that to me to do what? But, but I'm gonna, we're going to take a commercial break, and when we come back, I'm going to read something that somebody sent me about a year ago, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that makes sense. And I don't like when things make sense that make sense, you know, because you're like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> why didn't I think of that? So we're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, you're going to get to the Bible.
whether you're in the mood for chicken strips, a delicious burger, our classic banana split, or an upside down thick blizzard treat, we've got you covered. Hot and fresh food every day, every time. And delicious DQ soft serve make the perfect pair at your favorite place. Not fast food, fan food fast. Your Blue Ridge, Ella Day, and Jasper Dairy Queens are your meet, eat, and treat headquarters. Thank you for choosing DQ. How may I serve you? The mountains are calling, and they're closer than you think. Farmers Crossing in Ball Ground offers creekside lots with homes beginning in the 400s. Walking distance to downtown shopping, dining, tennis courts, Calvin Farmer Park, and local events. It also includes a beautiful hike to Long Swamp Creek. Leave the car and the worries behind. Move in by fall 2023. Call Sherry Martin at 404-375-0590 or Evelyn Calhoun at 770-733-0779. Georgia Medical Treatment Center now has two locations to bring you the high quality holistic care you've come to know and expect. We treat neck, back, and joint pain with chiropractic care and injection-based treatment without the need for surgery or prescription painkillers. Our medical weight loss program can also provide relief while ridding your body of toxins, pounds, and inches while improving your overall health. Call today for a free consultation, 770-345-2000, or go online to georgiamtc.com. You know, how you feel on the inside yeah. is just as important to me as how you feel on the outside. Oh, Daddy. <laughs> I'm grown up, grown up, grown up, up in every way, way, in every way, way care and take care of you. You're my grown up, and I know you're there. I'm your grown up, and you know I care. Cause it's you and me, and me, and, me and, you. and you. So when you are okay, or not okay, I'll take care of you. in the pool, making a masterpiece, or just making memories, writing a great American novel, or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow. Whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge. Get your notepad, take notes. Tell us where to go in the Bible to fix today's world. Tell us if people are sitting at home and they want to find a place to fix things. To fix things. So we, How do we fix this world? We're going to what do, do we do? We're going to, <laughs> well, hmm, that's, that's a big question. That, that, that is a big question. It is. Um, it has to start with one of us. Well, you could start with God and government. Mm -hmm. Now, not talking about civil government this, at this time. When God created heavens and the earth, Adam and Eve, there was no government per se. It was called self-government. If you have good self-government, you don't need other governments to tell you what to do. Uh -huh. um, children, if they're raised right, uh -huh. then they don't need the policeman to watch them all the time. Uh -huh. uh, it, re it really goes back to self, our own self-government uh -huh. and learning to do what's right and know what's wrong. We learn that by reading the Bible. Right. We learn our lessons. We learn from the stories. We learn from the commands. There's basically nothing in life that is not addressed in the scriptures, 
either directly by command or principally. Uh, this, this is when I used to go around the country and talk about biblical worldview, because most, uh, most Christians, even though they may read the Bible, don't have a biblical worldview. They don't see life through God's lenses. Um, to prove that, sometimes I'd ask a group, um, tell me what the Bible says about life insurance. And they go, what? Yeah, what? What about private property? Uh, and just go down this list and people are like, what? <laughs> you know, but that does, it does deal with those types of things, mm -hmm. principally, if not directly. One of the big ones, I think, is the story of, of Joseph in Egypt when he had the vision or he t in interpreted the vision of the, of the seven lean years and the seven good years. Uh -huh. And so they, they exacted a 20% premium against people and put it in a reserve until the time of need when the seven years was up and the famine came, this would be taken care of. Well, that's all the elements of insurance right there. You charge a premium, you, you know how long you're on the, on the hook for. The insurance company sells you a one-year uh, policy, a one-year uh, life insurance policy, maybe a five-year, maybe a 10-year, and then the actuarials figure out what the risks are right. and they assign a premium to it. So in this case, it was a 20% premium. They stored it into the reserve. Insurance companies are required to have a reserve in case something catastrophic happens. And then at the time of need, the benefit is paid out. And in this, this case, it would have been the, the grain or the wheat or whatever they collected. So that is the principles of insurance right mm -hmm. there in the Bible. Um, and also, it tells, uh, tells us that a, a family that doesn't take care of its own is worse than an infidel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have a responsibility to take care of our parents and to take care of our children. Mm -hmm. And one way we can do that today is through life insurance. We don't live in an agrarian society anymore. We can't just give them the land. Mm -hmm. So basically insurance gives us the cash to bury someone and to carry on into the future. Mm -hmm. So that's just one little example of how practical the Bible is. The Bible goes into um, warfare, I mean, how to fight a war, uh, including like not killing trees and things like that that we do today, uh, those kind of things, of, of not making uh, covenants with ungodly nations. Mm -hmm. right. And we do that all the time. Oh, yeah. America yeah. does that all the time. Right. So, I mean, there's really nothing in here. We can't employ your employee relationships. That's in here. Uh, just on and on and on. Th this is so much more than a soul food book or a devotional book. It is that, but it's so much more. Well, you know, I'm looking at that Bible. It has small writing. I'm laughing because one of my friends just got me a Bible with a little bit big, bigger writing, <laughs> which is good when you, when you get old. It's a fatter Bible. But I was looking at my phone, my friend Fred, you know, who produced Heart of the Home, he had an app on his phone that was the Bible, mm -hmm. and he would he would refer to it all the time. And, and it was so weird to me because there's no excuse. You know, if you're sitting in a parking lot waiting on somebody, you can get out an app on your phone. You can get your Bible. If you want to carry your Bible with you, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But Jeremiah 29, 11, always, that is like my favorite go-to. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I met a kid years ago that was doing a Christian organization trying to help teenagers. And I just, that just stuck with me. And I'm like, we all, there's a Bible verse that we all could participate in. We could choose a Bible verse and try to live just that one verse in our everyday life, whether it be love your neighbor as yourself, you know, just choose a verse and say, okay, today, Lord, I'm going to live by this verse, and whoever I meet today, I'm going to treat that way. Could we make life better if we just chose Certainly. one Bible verse? Certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like Solomon's analogy, too, of the, the grasshopper and the ant. Consider mm -hmm. how they operate, you know. Yeah, because if you if you wind up in the hard times, you have nothing. You should have looked at the ant a little bit closer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking of ants, in in school we did that, and the teacher taught us that those ants can take over, can't they? Well, they store, they store yeah, up. Pretty smart. <laughs> I mean, there's going to be a hard winter coming, and, yeah. and we're in it right now, of course. Yeah, and if yeah. you're you're not ready, then it's going to hurt. Yeah. Wow. You're going to wind up going to borrow some money somewhere. Yeah. Think about the economy right now. People are hungry, people are struggling, people are suffering. And I said, I think that's what brings out the mean in me because as we collected coats for homeless veterans, we ended up with 245 coats for homeless veterans just on our little group from ETC in our office and, and just 245 coats. Didn't make a dent in the 10,000 we needed, but other people were doing the same thing. If each one of us had gathered 245 coats, then all the veterans on the street that are living under a bridge would have a coat. 
that doesn't fix the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is the veterans should have a house to live in and the illegals ought to be where they came from. Right. End of story. If you come here legally, I'm all for it. One of my best friends came here legally and has worked all of her life and, and is a very accomplished, very accomplished person and helps everybody. But there is no excuse in America for us to find a veteran under a bridge with a blanket waiting on a new coat to be brought to him. What's the it's old saying? about stupid. What's the old saying? Give a man a fish and he'll come back the next day hungry, but if you teach him how to fish. Right, right. You know. No excuse for it, and and we should build well, shelters, we should build hospitals, we should build camps, we should build, you know, we, we've got buildings sitting empty all over America, all over America, buildings sitting empty because it's outdated or it's this or it's that. Go in there and turn it into housing for veterans. It'd be, it'd be wonderful to do that. Oh, yeah, it would. It's yeah. Uh, another thing, another issue that we don't talk about too much but it, it, and it does damage in, in a lot of ways and that's the, the idea of eschatology uh, that? that's the fu the doctrine of future things oh. you know people are always saying Jesus is coming back this is exactly what's supposed to happen so you know we just wait for Jesus to, sh to show up what I believe I, and I really believe this that what we're seeing here is not Jesus coming back anytime soon it's, it's the end of America it scares me. And, and I, I think it's true. Me. I think I think it's going to die. I don't know how or when, but it's, yeah. it's, you can't live this way no. and no. do the things that our leaders are doing no. and live. I agree. And um, you just hope you ain't yeah. here to see it. Well, and that the thing, <laughs> I was sitting there last night, I started crying. I went and had supper with Ansley and Zanna, and as I was driving home, I started crying because I thought my life is very close to being over, but hers is just beginning. It's the way life works. And it's, oh, it's gut-wrenching. Yeah. You hate to leave them, but, you know, it's the way the, life, the cycle of I life know, works. I know. But so. they don't have the chances we had. They no. don't have the stability we had. They don't have the family structure we had. Yeah. I look at guys it's that so are, sad. I look at guys that are in their 80s now, and I tell each one of them, I said, y'all lived the better days of this country. Yes. Y'all yeah. yes. really did. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you yes. just, you know, and a lot of them know it, too. Oh, Yes. But there's no excuse for where we are in America today. No, there's there's no not excuse. one no. excuse that you can make me believe, understand, or swallow. I'm not swallowing any of that crap. <laughs> I'm just not. They're all well, full of... We, we have to realize that our leaders, the ones that we see out there in the Congress and the President and all those people, they're a reflection of us. <laughs> they no, are. they're not. They, no, are. they, are they wouldn't, they wouldn't oh, be gosh. there. Not of me and you and him. Not of me and you and him. But, but, <laughs> yeah, he's right. No. But <laughs> you know, right. they wouldn't be there if it yeah. wasn't for, for yeah. yeah. How do you think they keep getting votes? It's yeah. like gagging a maggot. Oh God, don't compare us with them. <laughs> well, we get what we deserve. Oh no, no. Yeah. As a you nation. See what time it is? This hour's gone. Oh, I see it. The clock this on the wall. This hour's gone. We're so. done. We're gonna have to do it again. <laughs> we're have to have part two. We're yeah. gonna have to have part two. And you really didn't even get in that deep. I know. The question you I asked know. him is, what can you tell? Pick a verse. I mean, Any open the verse Bible, and turn live it over, by that. And yeah. It's all Today, in there. Yeah. It's all in there. It is. It is. Well, thank you both for being oh, here. Yeah, it's and fun. We're going to do it again. Yeah, let's do it anytime. We're going to do it again. You know, uh, we slam the bad stuff, but the truth will stand when everything else fails, and, and we might as well hit it, and, and we might as well do something about it while we can. While we can. That's why I said earlier. Just yeah, do what and you Bill can was going to sing a song. He was going to sing Old Rugged Cross, so we didn't do that. I swear. <laughs> We'll do it next time. <laughs> we'll do it next time. Yeah, her tears and makeup is coming down her face. Her makeup is coming down her cheeks. All right, y'all. We will be on YouTube with this in just a little bit. Share it with your friends. And that will re-air again tonight at 5 o'clock and again at 11 p.m. We're, sorry, we're sorry we made you cry. I know, I know. It's a good day. Bye, y'all.